You're listening to The Break Podcast, powered by CareerCloud. It happened that Christmas of 2007. So I, at the time, my day job was in St. Louis, but I'm from Jersey. So I always go to Jersey for uh, the holidays. When my parents were taking me back to the airport to go back to St. Louis, I was like so quiet in the car. My parents uh, used to always tell me that when I was a kid, if I wasn't talking or causing trouble, they knew something was wrong. Either I'm sick or something's bothering me. And they said, is everything okay? And I, the first words that came out of my mouth were, I don't want to go back to St. Louis. And they're like, what do you mean? You don't want to go back to St. Louis? I'm like, well, I don't, it's not St. Louis necessarily, but I don't want to go back to my job. I want to teach math. That was that moment when I realized I didn't want to go back. That was when I knew I have to start figuring out a way in that new direction. And so that's kind of like where planning and all these things started. This episode is sponsored by ZipRecruiter. If you need a change and are looking for a new job, or if you're looking to hire for your small business, please check out ZipRecruiter today. Their smart technology matches the right candidates to the right jobs and sends new opportunities right to your inbox. They make finding a job or hiring the right person easier than ever. ZipRecruiter, the smarter way to hire. Try ZipRecruiter for free today by going to ZipRecruiter.com and tell them I sent you. Roger, welcome to the show. I am so excited to kick off 2024 with you as my first guest to hopefully set the tone for this entire year. Hey, man, I'm excited to be here. You and I are kindred spirits. We, we share a lot of topics in common, so I feel like this is going to be a fun conversation. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. Uh, we definitely have hit it off. We've already had one talk in the books, and we've both agreed that it's it was the first of many. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you about reinvention and your story and why that topic you know, really propels you to do the work that you do today. And I want to really start with you know, 2007 and what you kind of call your call to reinvention. What did that call sound like? Let's start the conversation there. Yeah, love that. So in 2007, I was testing out, like I had put up an ad on Craigslist to tutor math. And the reason I did that was actually to make a little extra money to pay off my student loans more quickly. I did that. I got a student and it was like awesome. I really enjoyed that. I mean, it wasn't just making extra money. It was like, this is time I genuinely enjoy. Now, I didn't follow up that student with another one because at the time I was also parking cars. I was working ballet as a ballet parking attendant. So I was making extra money like that. But once I finished and I decided oh, I'm done parking cars, it's just taking way too much of a toll on my like body and all that because working a full-time day job, plus that at nights, like it was just too much. When I had that gap open or that space or that vacuum, if you will, I was just like, I wonder if I could do more tutoring. And so I found a job at a learning center close to where I lived. And I got a role there to just help with math and teach math there. And of course, they brought the clients, right? So I didn't have to worry about fishing for clients on my own. I just showed up. They gave me an hourly pay. And you know, I, I worked as many hours as I could after my day job, right? So I would get out like around five or six, and then I'd head right over to the learning center. I loved that. Like I loved those maybe eight to 10 hours tops per week more than I loved the 50 that I was doing during the day. And I didn't have an issue with my day job at the time. I was working as an account, uh, as a national account sales manager, and my account was Anheuser-Busch. We sold them beer coolers that made the temperature of the beer colder than its freezing point. So we used to joke around and say, like, we're making the world one better, one cold beer at a time. <laughs> and it was a cool job because, I mean, they were my client. They party like crazy. And I get to go everywhere with them, including the in 2007, the uh, Super Bowl was in Miami and they were hosting the Bud Bowl parties. And that, it's like a three day nonstop party. It stops from like 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. every single day for cleanup to turn over the space and get back to partying. And I got to go hang out for that, you know, all expenses paid, all of that. It was nuts. So cool job for a single 25 year old guy. But man, something about those eight to 10 hours at the learning center was starting to like show me, whoa, I think I'm falling in love with something else. 
And so for me, that was the moment that I started to really hear that call to do something different. And as I stayed at that part-time job and continued working, you know, the call just got louder and louder. So, so to set this to, to, you know, to just make sure everybody understands you are a, you know, very, um, default path guy at this point, right? You are highly educated. You are a smart kid. You've got a nice job that you actually really like. And because you were dabbling in ways to make extra money, and this was, you, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was really driven by like, I need to pay my student loans back faster yeah. kind of a thing. Yep. So you were, take, you were doing some experimentation around how do I just make extra income basically just to pay that off. And you all of a sudden fall into a, a situation and start to really get pulled in this direction. Now, I think everybody can, can kind of see themselves maybe in that situation a little bit. You took it to the extreme where you're saying like, just this side hustle, this, th- these, these few hours that I'm working, there is something there yeah. and it is strong enough to pull me and start rejecting my traditional path some. So I want to know, I want to know what is that? What is that feeling? It can't just be, oh, I love this. Cause most of us say, yeah, we, we would love to be baseball players or we would love to do yoga our whole lives or whatever. Like wh- how did this engine start to really burn inside of you? I love this question and I'm not sure I've ever gotten it. So it's going to be a fun <laughs> reflection. You know, it, the difference was it wasn't so much about love as it was about fulfillment. I felt like my cup was full in a way that I had never realized it could be full. I thought it was full up until then, um, but no, it was not. And I felt like my cup was full in a way that was just very new to me and very exciting. So that was one thing. But the moment that I really knew, okay, something's going on here and something has to give, like either I got to let go of this potential interest or I need to go all in on this potential interest or start moving in that direction in a more serious way. And it happened that Christmas of 2007. So I, at the time, my day job was in St. Louis, but I'm from Jersey. So I came back, I always go to Jersey for uh, the holidays. So I was home for like a week, week and a half or whatever my usual trip would be. And when my parents were taking me back to the airport to go back to St. Louis, I was like so quiet in the car. Now sitting in, I think maybe the front or the back, it doesn't really matter, but I was really quiet. Now, my parents uh, used to always tell me that when I was a kid, like little, little kid, if I wasn't talking or causing trouble, they knew something was wrong. Either I'm sick or something's bothering me. And so here I am sitting like so quiet, way too quiet, uncharacteristically quiet in the back of the car. And they said, is everything okay? And I, the first words that came out of my mouth were, I don't want to go back to St. Louis. And they're like, well, what, what do you mean? You don't want to go back to St. Louis. I'm like, well, I don't, it's not St. Louis necessarily, but I don't want to go back to my job. Like I, I want to, I want to teach math. I don't know how or what, or what that looks like, but I just know that I no longer want to do this thing. Like I, it's finally hit me. Like I don't want to do it. And that was the moment where I started to dread, maybe dread is too strong a word, but I wasn't looking forward to Monday mornings anymore. I wasn't looking forward to all of those things. I, not even the trips were as exciting anymore. The trips kind of lost a little bit of their excitement and zeal because there was something else I was interested in. And it, it, it was kind of like weird, but here's a weird metaphor. It's like being in a relationship. Like I was married to you know, this career and someone else came along and just got my interest and I can't stop thinking about her. <laughs> and that was math. And so that, that was that moment where when I realized I didn't want to go back, that was when I knew I have to start figuring out a way in that new direction. And so that's kind of like where planning and all these things started. So I think a lot of us can relate to, you know, getting, finding the muse a little bit, right? But I think a lot of us, vast majority, 70, 80, 90, 95% of us, maybe even, um, you know, start to immediately discount that. Um, so yeah, I feel this and that would be great, but, um, you know, at 25, that's a step back. I'm assuming you weren't going to come in, you know, making the kind of money that you were, um, where's the track? What would my parents think? You know, all of these types of things, right. And it seemed like you were really pulled 
so hard and you had such an emotional reaction that maybe you were able i'm sure i'm sure those things went through your head but but it seems like you you went through those in a way where you really honored that feeling and i'm really curious as to how that transpired you know in your mind and in your body cuz i certainly have a really hard time have had a really hard time with that you know how can i do this what's the path um what will people think all of, all of those yeah. you know the butts how did you deal with the butts yeah so there's there's two ways that i dealt with it one was not so much something i did actively but something that i felt at the time so i'll add another thing kind of going back to the original question which is like what was that inner working there was something i discovered as i was engaging in teaching math and it was that i felt i was tapping into a version of myself that could be outstanding at something mm -hmm. and that was different than what i was doing what i was doing i felt like i'm good at it like i'm good at at talking bs and doing all the things i have to do with clients to like keep them happy and all those kinds of things and when there's issues i know how to bs my way out of those and make them seem like good things and blah 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 so i felt like i'm good at that but that didn't feel like something i even wanted to or could be outstanding at and all of a sudden i'm doing this thing where i'm teaching math and of course i'm a beginner at this so i'm not like great at it but i felt like i feel like this could be my thing i i use this the example the way i would explain it to people the feeling was that i felt as if i was michael jordan but i had started playing baseball first mm -hmm. sure i could be good at baseball just mm -hmm. like michael jordan was good at baseball but he could never he was not going to be outstanding at baseball and it was as if like michael jordan was playing pickup basketball with his friends after work you know after baseball practice he goes and plays pickup and he's just like man those few hours playing pickup basketball with my buddies that feels so damn good like it feels amazing to do that and I feel like I could be outstanding at this. And that feeling now taps into something else. This is not love anymore. This is not even fulfillment. This is like my best self might be over there. Right. And, and I am by staying here, I am not realizing my best self. That becomes really scary, by the way. And all of a sudden, those doubts, those objections, those but or what ifs or all of those things, they start to shrink in the face of what if my best self is over there? What if the best version of me is somewhere outside of where I am today? So that was like, you know, so that answer is kind of like for both questions. But then the other thing that really helped me with navigating like the, the, all the doubts and the objections, there was a buddy of mine who was going through the same thing. We had both graduated from Penn State. We had both ended up at Ingersoll Rand. We both went through the same uh, leadership development program. So we were like on the similar path. We lived in the same dorm like building on the same floor, like across the hall from each other. So, I mean, our journeys had been like together for a while and we both had this curiosity to do something else. So in 2007, his looked a little different than mine. Mine was this falling in love with math kind of thing. His was, I've got some business ideas I want to bring to life. And I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur, but maybe there's something to this. And of course, back in 2007, what was hot in the news was all the stuff going on in, in, in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Everything was brand new. Facebook was new, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, all these things, you know, all the platforms are new. And so he was getting caught up in that fever and really thinking about, you know, maybe I can build a startup. Maybe I can launch something like that. So we both just met uh, or spoke daily, I think almost daily. I was looking up some old emails to see if I could kind of deconstruct how much time we sp spent on the phones. And we referred to a lot of phone calls, but we also emailed each other a lot, just back and forth emails, like with ideas like, hey, man, I just found this. Check this out. I think this could be a good resource for what you're trying to do. I had a buddy. And when you're when you have that one buddy, like and I read through those emails, I realized, wow, we really leaned on each other. And in the moments that we were most scared, we were writing it to each other in emails. And then we were responding, hey, man, you got this. Like, don't worry about it. It's gonna and he quit before I did. He quit like I think in March and then I quit in May. So we even quit two months apart. So that's how in sync we were on taking the leap. So I took the leap with someone else. So I think between the fear of missing out on the, my best self and having someone to be there who was also going through the exact same thing at the exact same time, I was able to navigate or mitigate the impact of some of these objections. Because people did bring up the objections. I mean, when I turned it, I turned in the uh, 
my um, resignation letter to my to my manager at the time, he started talking about, well, your health insurance and you're never going to get yeah. another job again and you're going to burn all the bridges and blah, blah, blah. Oh my gosh, the dude went on and on about all the things sure. that could go wrong. Anybody I told gave me all the, only one guy told me like something encouraging, but almost everyone gave me warnings, which by the way, I was thankful for the warnings because it helps you prepare for what might happen. So at least you start to, you know, plan ahead because <laughs> when you're dreaming, you don't pay attention to the risks. But if somebody's handing them to you, you just jot them down and keep them for later in case you need them. So I want to dig into this idea of um, you, that feeling of I could be outstanding at something and, and kind of pursuing this best version of yourself. Looking backwards from that moment, like into how you grew up, into your childhood, into your young adulthood. Did you connect the dots of at all from this experience of like you chasing that feeling or or having that feeling um as a as a younger person and I ask because I personally can think about you know how, how I felt at certain times in my childhood of feeling very mediocre and just being like average at a whole bunch of different things and just wanting that feeling of of being the best at something or finding like what is inside me, like that sort of thing. And, and I mean, I, I can definitely connect it forward to what I do today. And, yeah. and, and that is a, it's a part of me. And I'm curious as to like, if you were able to connect any of those dots or it found any interesting learnings. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I did not no, okay. can think about that actively, but thinking about it now, what you said about you know feeling mediocre at a lot of things i i definitely felt like when i think about you know sixth seventh and eighth grade i guess my strength back then was math that was kind of it like that was the strength and and it was around sixth grade that i started getting into like playing sports more um up until then i was just doing it to give it a try but i never really got into it until like sixth seventh eighth grade and that's when i got into soccer and all of that um, and that's when I started to find something like, oh, I really like this. And I, you know, I could, you know, this could be a thing that I really pursue or whatever or enjoy. And so when I think about that, I guess there were, there were moments where I made a distinction like, oh, I think there could be certain things that I could lean into and, and be outstanding at or better at. And there was, there was a moment where as much as, as, as much in love as I was with, uh, soccer, I discovered martial arts. And when I got into that, I put soccer down for like a while uh, to get into that. And I guess if I think about it, just that willingness to be able to drop something that I was enjoying, you know, like, like a job that I was enjoying, like traveling with Anheuser-Busch and all of those things for something that was calling me and I felt drawn to. I wonder if there's a pattern there, if that was just something I was already developing a comfort with being able to do that. Right. And by the way, then when I when there was an opportunity in soccer to get really into something else, like there was a team or uh, an opportunity to join a certain team, I actually very quickly also dropped the martial arts to go back into soccer and do that. And so I kind of made those switches and all that, really trying to find something I think that felt really right for me. And those are the two things, that and math. Um, but yeah, those are for me, like the things that made me feel like I'm onto something that is helping me discover like maybe my better self or a better version of myself. Uh, and I liked me in those things, in soccer, in martial arts, and in math. You know, uh, those are things like when I'm in, do in those activities, I definitely felt at my best. I felt probably most fulfilled, confident, even as a teenager who's trying to navigate all the stuff that a teenager navigates. In those moments, I felt great. Like I just, I, yeah, those, and since I, those activities covered a lot of time <laughs> in my life, you know, like math classes during the day. And then soccer at night, you know, like, um, it, it really helped me feel good as I navigated certain moments. And I guess math coming back to teaching math now, like when I got into teaching math, yeah, I wonder if that was something similar that I, I just kind of felt familiar. You're listening to the break podcast powered by career cloud. This episode is sponsored by ZipRecruiter. If you need a change and are looking for a new job, or if you're looking to hire for your small business, please check out ZipRecruiter today. Their smart technology matches the right candidates to the right jobs and sends new opportunities right to your inbox. 
that make finding a job or hiring the right person easier than ever. ZipRecruiter, the smarter way to hire. Try ZipRecruiter for free today by going to ZipRecruiter.com and tell them I sent you. How did your parents, friends, uh, people close to you sort of react when you made this this choice? Um, and I, I'm really thinking of it from the standpoint of like, you know, our culture is so money, career, success <clears throat> oriented. And this seems like a very enlightened decision for a 25 year old to make to go in a different direction and, and put sort of that heart first. I'm curious as to how, like what support system you had around you or not um, when making that decision and how they felt about it. So my parents, they were definitely scared for me, right? Yeah. I mean, they, they, they don't have college degrees. And, okay. and so for them, my sister and I were the first ones in our family getting a college degree. And so here I am like, you know, okay, they, they mission accomplished. We, we got our kids to this <laughs> milestone and now, oh no, our firstborn is like just, you know, leaving that path altogether. What the heck? And in their minds and just in their experience, um, I mean, they, they, they only, they only knew that path as a way to, you know, a better life and all of that. So for them, it was more, they just felt, I think, scared for me. But at the same time, I'm so fortunate because they were honestly also supportive. They didn't make me feel bad about it. Um, they, they definitely were the voice of reason from time to time. You know, they would help me see like, hey, there might be some risks here. Be careful with this. Take care of that. All of those things. But I always felt that at the end of the day, they believed in me and that I would figure something out. And so I think just knowing that uh, definitely helped me. Uh, I think along the way, it gives you a level of confidence, even as you're navigating really tough moments, the, the down moments on that journey. Um, but they were supportive. And as far as like other family, extended family, and, and maybe their friends and all of that, I, you know, I didn't talk too much about it. And I've kind of been good at uh, n covering my ears. Like when I feel like, no, nah, that's not, I don't want to hear that. Like, I don't want to hear what people are saying. So I, I think I really just let my parents hear it. <laughs> so they heard it from others and I was living far, I was living in St. Louis. So I was away from the family. So I didn't have to hear it that directly. And, uh, so that made it easier. Uh, so I actually, I don't know what my aunts, uncles, <laughs> cousins even thought about it. I would have to ask them today, actually, if I want to know what they thought about it when they heard the news that I had done that, but I didn't really check in with anybody. Cause honestly, I just like, so when we get together for family reunions, you know, I talked about whatever I was doing at the moment. If I was back in school, I talked about school, like working on my master's degrees or whatever. I probably found ways to navigate that, but I just didn't want to know. Uh, so if I didn't think it was going to be constructive, honestly, I didn't really, like I covered my ears. I'm like, I'd rather not know. I'll let my mom and dad hear it and then they can filter whatever they think I need to know. And then they can share that with me. But I had their support for sure. And that actually helped a lot. Friends mixed, you know, some were excited for me. Some were very scared for me. Um, you know, and, and I appreciated the ones who were scared for me because they cared about me. Uh, I actually like, you know, one of my closest friends, you know, he was worried. He thought I'd maybe be burning myself out during certain moments of the journey where I was doing too much, or he thought I was doing too much. Um, but I, I appreciated that. <laughs> I mean, I appreciated that, you know, he loved me so much that he looked out for me in that way. Um, but at the end of the day, he never said, you know, get back to like, get back to a corporate job, yeah. and, you know, still supported it. And even when things came crashing down at times, like my first divorce and all of that, he was the first one there to catch me. So whenever I fell, boom, he was there anyway. So even though he was the one at times like saying, you know, this is not good for you, blah, 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 you know, and, and he would be kind of like a parent almost. He was also the first one there to catch, like, you know, catch me when something went wrong on that journey. Got it. So tell everybody about, so it, be, you decide to become a math teacher or you want to become a math teacher, but this was yeah. no straight arrow to becoming a math teacher you had to go through a lot of stuff yeah. um and find ways around roadblocks to doing this and this is a really important aspect of of people who are resilient and adaptable and flexible it's called it's, it's really called um kind of this uh, i think it's like pathways theory in psychology like people who figure out a way around multiple ways to to solve a problem so tell yeah. us the, a little bit of the story and backstory of how how you became a teacher what you had to go through to do that and then i do want to kind of get on to some of the other reinventions that yeah. you had in your 
in your career so far? Yeah. So <laughs> becoming a teacher was a four year journey. So from the moment I quit to the moment I ended up in a classroom for the very first time, that was a four-year journey. Um, when I got onto the journey, no clue how long that was going to take. And even at that point, I wouldn't even say that I knew that the classroom is where I was going to end up or wanted to end up. It was something that I figured out as I went. So for me, the biggest challenge I had up front was that I don't have a math degree. Um, I didn't have a, I don't have an education degree. Um, I don't, obviously I wasn't a certified teacher or a licensed teacher in any state. So I didn't have that going for me. So to teach math, to practice this thing that I want to do, like the one avenue is completely shut down for me because there are legal barriers to getting in there. And so I, that's where tutoring came in. I really thought, well, then there's another way. I'll just tutor like crazy. So I just kept tutoring every, like every chance I got, I tutored as much as I could. I knew that if I just put in the hours, I would just get really good at this. Now, I didn't know what really good looks like because I was in a new field. So I don't know what really good looks like, but I believed that if I keep practicing this, I will get better. And so I just continued doing that. And I started to, uh, a reputation started to form about me uh, in St. Louis, in the community that I lived in, because people would refer me to other families and all of that to tutor their other kids and stuff. And it was that I was kind of like almost a, a miracle worker of sorts. Like I was somebody that you could send your most struggling kid in math to me and I will turn them around. And, and that came because partly because I was also using psychology and the science of executive coaching applied to teaching math. And so I was able to do things that teachers can't do because they don't have that training. They don't have that knowledge. And so I just applied whatever I was learning in my master's in psychology to tutoring math. And so I had fun doing that. Honestly, I wasn't even thinking about being in the classroom. I was just like, man, maybe I can grow this business into something really big. Maybe I could live off of tutoring. I don't know, but I'm enjoying every minute that I tutor. And it's just so rewarding and fulfilling to be able to help kids that are really struggling, really, really struggling. I'm talking like, and desperately needed the grades in order to get, unlock a scholarship or get into the school they wanted to get into. And I took on the toughest cases and I loved the toughest cases. They were the most rewarding for me. So I was having a blast for those four years before I ended up in the classroom. But as I was starting to get closer to that fourth year, I was also plotting a move back home to New Jersey. And as I was doing that and I got back home, I started thinking about what am I going to do now? All my clients are in St. Louis and the tools weren't really there for virtual tutoring. So that wasn't going to be as easy of an option back in 2011, 12 time. So we didn't have Zoom the way we have it now and all the other tools. So then I was starting to think about like, well, do I just resume tutoring here and find new clients? And that's what I did first thing. And I started finding those clients, but I knew that that wasn't going to cut it right away. And I thought maybe if I could find something else, maybe teaching in a classroom. And of course, again, I ran into those same requirements. I'm looking this up on the internet. I'm like, oh man, I just finished a master's in psychology and a part-time MBA at the same time from 2008 to 2010. I'm not looking to go back to school and get a whatever degree I need in order to unlock that license or that cert certificate to teach in New Jersey. So I actually was, I'm not even sure what I was doing at the time to look for those types of jobs, or maybe it was just more tutoring, but it was a bit of a chance encounter. I was at a golf, um, a golf outing with a buddy of mine who invited me to join him. He had bought the tickets. I said, sure. I just started taking lessons two weeks earlier with a buddy <laughs> of mine. And, and I was like, well, I know how to swing and hit a ball. So yeah, sure. Let's do it. And at the luncheon and the, the golf outing was hosted by a school district and it was part of their fundraisers. And my buddy had bought the tickets for that. And so we're at the luncheon and one of the people who works for the superintendent was just walking around trying to meet everybody who th she didn't know at the event, you know, networking and all of that came to our table. And she asked me and my buddy, he's like, all right, tell me about you guys. What do you guys do? And when it came to my turn, I just said what I'd been doing in St. Louis for the last like several years. You know, I take the the toughest cases, you know, for math students, the ones who struggle the most, and I turn them around. I get them to pass their classes. And she's like, interesting. I want to introduce you to somebody. And then she walked me over to superintendent of the school district that was hosting this fundraising uh, golf outing. And, you know, I, she barely says like, you know, this little intro on my behalf. I start to speak my own intro. He cuts me off, looks at her. And then he says, um, Linda, set up a meeting with this young man uh, in the next two weeks uh, at my office. And then he walks away. 
And I'm just like, <laughs> that was kind of rude, but, but <laughs> did I just score a meeting for something? And she goes, yeah. So we, he, there are two schools in the district that he run, that he's the superintendent for that are actually failing in math. So I think he wants to talk to you about that. That's why I brought you here because I know we have that problem. And so I was like, holy crap, what is this going to turn into? And so I get in the room with him and this is where I'm like, I don't even know what I could do realistically. This is a public school district. Legally, I can't teach for this. So I don't know. Um, is he going to book me as a, as a tutor for after school or like, <laughs> I don't even have the imagination at this point for what is it going to happen? What is about to happen? So then we, I start telling him what I could do for students. I tell him what I've been doing. I just tell stories because that's all I have at this point. I don't have credentials. I'm not an education yeah. consultant, none of this. So I just tell him stories about the kids that I've been helping. Some of the, the highlight cases of really fun ones. And he, uh, and then I say, maybe I could do stuff like this and all of that. And then at some point he stops me, he interrupts me. This guy interrupts a lot, by the way. And he says, you can stop talking now. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, wow, that didn't work out then. I guess that's not a good sales pitch. And he said, no, I'm sold. I'm sold because it's your passion that's selling me. Yeah. That's it. I know you don't have the credentials for this. I know you've never done this in your life. You've never consulted for a school. You've never taught. I know this. We Google stalked you already. We searched, we, we looked <laughs> you up. I already know all this stuff. But I also know that everything I just heard and that energy you have, I want that in my schools. I know that if you are in those schools and I don't even know what that looks like, I don't know what the role looks like. I don't know what you're going to be doing, but I know that if you're there and you're near those students, you can make things better and you'll find a way. And we don't know that way right now, but we'll figure it out together. And so we did. So then, you know, he gave me a contract as a consultant. He found a way to get me in legally. Um, he found a way to get me into the classroom. Turns out that the rule or the law says that there has to be a licensed teacher in the classroom, but the rule doesn't say that a licensed teacher has to be the one speaking. So he put a licensed teacher in the back corner of the room, grading papers for their own classes while I taught the algebra classes and the algebra two classes at the high school. And that was my first teaching gig, uh, getting to teach. And I was just like, oh my gosh, did this really just happen? And the way it happened, I was just blown away. Like, I can't believe this just happened. Um, you know, so the lesson I learned there was simply that one, really, you have to keep believing. I mean, I didn't know what I was getting into uh, four years of tutoring. Like I, I didn't know I could end up in a school, but I knew that I wasn't ready to say bye to, goodbye to math yet or goodbye to teaching. So when this opportunity popped up, I just said, yes, I showed up. I was my best self. I shared stories. I shared my passion. I shared my energy. And that's what sold me. And that's what got me somebody to believe in me so much that he got creative and found the way to even have to bend some rules in order to get me in the classroom. And that was my first shot at teaching. Two years later, he had to let me go because um, I was being paid as a consultant and the budget from that he was paying me from got cut. And so he didn't have the money to pay me. Plus, they had an excess of math teachers on the bench. And so he goes, I, I can't like even justify putting you in the classroom when I have teachers on the bench who have license, like they're licensed, they're certified by the state, all of that. So I'm really sorry, man, but I, I really can't. So at the end of this year, this will be your, your last one. I can't renew you. I appreciated the honesty and, and the fact that he gave me the heads up. And I was able to get a job teaching at a private school. Turns out I didn't know private schools don't need teachers to be licensed or certified. Um, you don't even have to have a degree in education or math or anything like that. Private schools can hire anybody to teach math. So boom. That was a cool rule to learn. And I was able to teach in the middle school classroom for two years. I get goosebumps when I hear that, when I hear stuff like that, because I talk a lot about the different ways we create advantage for ourselves. Like most people think it's about uh, what you know, your skills, all of this kind of stuff. But there is absolute truth to passion and energy as an advantage. And I think you're, that story is just living proof. I mean, of course you had the skills to be able to teach, but you didn't have, you didn't check the other boxes, yep. but none of that stuff mattered. And you had a sponsor figure out a way around the rules because he wanted you in the role. And that's the magic of, of figuring out that intersection of what drives you and, and what can drive you for a really long time. Um, it just comes through and it's magic. I don't think everybody 
can necessarily get there. I don't think everybody, any, everybody has to get there to live a very fulfilling life. But I think that is the magic when you get to that intersection. It's a magical, magical journey. Yeah. And I think that comes from, you know, we, I hear a lot of times from people, you know, that following your passion is bad advice. I, I totally disagree. Not even respectfully, disrespectfully disagree with that. And, and there's a reason for it because it, it's, it's about how you do it. I'm not saying you have to go all in on your passion and just drop all your income and drop your job and, and salary job or whatever. No, but you can follow it on the side. If you yeah. are tapping into your passions, your best self starts to show. Yep. You start to radiate this energy that people cannot help but be drawn to. And that is what creates these opportunities for you to get in a room where you don't even know what the hell you're about to say to this guy to convince <laughs> him because legally you know that you can't do this. And But yet I showed up to the room and I did the only thing I could do, which is share stories because through those stories, my passion came, came out. And I consider this man, you know, his name is uh, Frank Gargiulo. Uh, he, I consider him one of the guiding angels on my journey to reinvention. In fact, I dedicated an entire chapter to the idea of what guiding angels on your journey means. And this is someone who in my journey removed a massive obstacle and you can't predict these. And I love that you use the word magic. Yeah, that's a great way to explain it. But that's also what makes the journey to reinvention so scary because I can't rationally explain magic to you. I can't right. tell you what the magic is that is going to happen in two or three years or four years or eight years. I can't tell you that. There's no way. But I can tell you that if your best self shows up, if you allow your best self to come out, and it usually comes out when you pursue your passions, then the conditions will be met for magic. And you just got to be out there. Can't be hiding. You got to be out there. And I promise you, magic will happen. Not because you did it, because someone like Frank had the ability and the power and the influence to make magic happen for me. But I had to do my part. <laughs> he wasn't going to do that for anybody. He wasn't going to break rules and laws for anybody. So he needed to really believe that this was a worthwhile risk and that he could handle that, that he can make this work. So yeah, yeah. This thing about magic, it's not something you can guarantee. There's no certainties around it, but that's the thing about magic. Right. And so I, I, I mean, I get into like these discussions with, uh, with people, you know, about it, and maybe you can, you, you might be able to help me with this. Like I, I try to rationally explain how, how this stuff works. Like I'm very, this might be a little bit of a tangent, but we're going to go with it anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm very convinced that, you know, if I'm thinking about probability distributions in my head right now, like we are left negatively skewed, right? Like all the time, um, because we can always see tangibility in the risks, in the downside, right? Like it, it, like we're we're pretty pretty adept at calculating what those are, um, being afraid of them, being trained to avoid what what we call quote unquote risks, and then like our upper bound, um, we essentially set. Like when when we when we make goals when we set goals and we are told our goals need to be achieve quote unquote achievable, we we set the upper limit of as as that is like our best case scenario. But where the magic is and what we don't what most people don't understand is that there's two sides to uncertainty. There's two sides to risk. Right. There's downside and there's upside, and we fail to put into our probability set the i guess it's the probability or the possibility that things can be way better and outcomes can happen way better than whatever our goals are and so when we are leading with passion when we are leading with energy um we are positively skewing our set and we're allowing for that the tail essentially the tail outcomes uh to be bigger better and greater than anything we can possibly rationally imagine in our minds. So that's like how I think about it. And I know that like not everybody's attuned to statistics and all that kind of stuff, but to me, that's what we're doing. Like when we make a decision, it isn't one, it's not one decision. Like it, it's a decision, but there's uncertainty. It could be better than expected, it could be worse than expected. We know what the downsides are, we can calculate that. We don't calculate 
and, and, and we have no concept of how to think about possibilities that we can't see being better than expected. And so we're systematically capping ourselves. Yeah. And so I think that's like energy, passion, all of those types of things are, are mainly like what, what end up getting us into better, as, better, better asymmetry to the positive side. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how we like, you know, we, we move, we remove these mental roadblocks and, and allow for that. And how do we, how do we bring that into our calculation of what to yeah. do? That was a little yeah. tangent, but I guess maybe just react to, to that yeah. and correct my math. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I definitely get what you're saying. And I think that when one of the things I tell people about goals is that whatever you come up with today is based only on what you know to be possible. Right, so exactly. That's cool. So know that. Know that whatever you write today is based on whatever you know to be possible as of today. But what I can promise you is that if you begin moving in that direction and you start making moves in that direction in a month's time, you will revise that goal yeah. because you'll know more about what's possible. Oh, I didn't know about this thing, but talking to these three or four people, I learned this. So essentially what I coach my clients to do and what I, what I do for myself is I, my goals are very flexible. They evolve. They're constantly breathing and living. So whatever I come up with today, I know that that's just for fun, something that I could write today. Oh, that's nice. I'm writing about something I know so little about <laughs> because it's a new goal in a new realm and a new area that I know very little about. So, so I, I humor myself and I say, I allow myself to write something, but I already know thanks to experience and this journey I've been on that. Oh, that's funny because I will never imagine whatever the, the Frank Gargiulo guiding angel coming into my life and removing this crazy legal barrier like could be like in this other field. And I leave that door open all the time. So that means that in a month, if the goal changes, that's cool. It changes. So I'm not worried about what I wrote a month ago. I just let myself write something. For me, that's how I kind of correct that to leave room for those possibilities that I'm not aware of today. And I just check in on those and continue to let that evolve. But what those initial goals do help me do, even if they are capped, is that at least they give me a direction for now. Right. It gets me started. And that's the extent to which I feel the goal is useful to me, is that it allows me to get started. If it lets me get started with podcasting or writing or whatever the thing is that I'm trying to do, then it was good enough to get me moving. I needed to get moving. Now that I'm moving, oh, wait a minute. Hold on. I just learned about so and so who was able to grow their podcast, you know, from this to that. Right. I didn't even think that was possible. Turns out it is. All right. Let's start. Look, maybe I'm looking at a new goal now by the time I learn about that. So I think that for me, that's how I, you know, I do that. But I love what you said about when we bring that energy, when we bring that passion, we are definitely skewing the possibilities or the probabilities uh, in our favor. We're activating the tail, we're making the tail way more probable than it's supposed to be under normal conditions because we are applying less than normal conditions. These are above average conditions. We are giving our above average self. We're tapping into a level of ourselves that is almost magnetic and radiant and just like hard. You can't ignore someone who's that fired up and passionate. Um, and I, you know, for anybody listening, ask people, what is it that lights you up the most? Because they'll notice when you smile and when you don't smile. It's hard for you to notice that in the moment, but I remember that someone told me at a networking event for a job that I was doing at the time that I was not enjoying. I was telling her about some of the tutoring I was doing on the side. And she goes, out of curiosity, do you know that when you talk about your tutoring stuff, you smile from ear to ear like the whole time. And when you talk about the consulting work that you're doing right now with this thing, this business for this other person, you like just there's no smile and it's so noticeable because in this one conversation with this woman like that was like maybe 10 minutes at a networking event and i managed to touch on both and she just saw like two humans two totally different people and so yeah that's the difference like when you're leaning into that thing that you really love that's a different version of you and yeah i think you create way more possibilities for and improve the probability of the tale i want to continue on this theme of like kind of deconstructing uh reinvention right and and we're on this topic of 
sort of how do you, how do you what what we're beating around is how do you figure out your secret sauce like how do you figure out the stuff that lights you up your circle of competence your zone of genius like whatever that is and i think there's two there's two elements so like one it one what is it and two how do i build like belief in faith belief and or faith that i need to keep going with that like how, how do you build the trust capacity that especially if it's not something that like oh my you know it's, it's very easy for somebody to say like oh yeah i'm super good with numbers and um i love finance and the stock market so i'm gonna go work at a hedge fund and you know make billion billion dollars and i found my zone of genius like okay great but like if my zone of genius is is math tutoring right it or or whatever it's like so one techniques for finding it and two what I call the belief flywheel. Like, how do you keep that belief flywheel going so you can sustain that effort for the four years it took you to become a uh, a teacher? You know, how like let's get into this a little bit of how how have you deconstructed this as as you wrote a book about the topic? You know, like I'm, I'm really <laughs> curious yeah. as to how you think about this. That's that that's a that's a really cool question. I like this a lot because yeah, how did I keep it going for four years? For me, one of the most important things that I learned a lot in those in that four year period was the the importance of really knowing what your other goals are, like the other areas of your life. So the the main one that really influences this, I think, is money and finances. Because if you believe you need to be a millionaire by a certain age, then tutoring is probably not the way to get there. Unless yeah. you're going to launch a tutoring company and become the CEO and never tutor for and never tutor again, um, because you're too busy running a massive organization like Varsity Tutors or whatever. Um, but hey, you're a millionaire now, and I think that that's the question that I had to uh, um, struggle with and wrestle with. I should say wrestle with is the right word, because at times, like everything you read you know or many times everything you read is about oh they made it big and they exited for a bazillion right. dollars and everyone money 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 and that's all it is you go to youtube like every video is about money like those are, like every yeah. title is about money because that's what we're all obsessed with right and tutoring was not going to make me a fortune and i didn't necessarily want to want to do what it would take for tutoring to make me a little more money because that would require really starting a business, having other people tutor for me. I'm like, I'm having a blast tutoring. So for me, it came down to what makes me happy? Am I fulfilled? Am I enjoying life right now? Am I satisfied? Like beyond satisfied, am I fulfilled? And honestly, when I ask myself that question, I'm like, I am the happiest I've ever been in my life. Like this is great. And I, and it's crazy because the years between 2008 and 2010, and I think I refer to this in the book, were two of the poorest years of my life. Um, I had so little, and yet I was so fulfilled, so happy with life, existence, everything going on every single day. The simplest things were just amazing. I, I, I had a blast because I was doing work that mattered to me. I was tutoring all of these incredible math students or students that wanted to learn math and become better at it. I was working on a master's in psychology that was just blowing my mind, teaching me so many things that allowed me to be better for my students. The work I was doing was so rewarding, so fulfilling. I loved life. I mean, life was so good. So that's what kept me going through all the, through those years. And those are two really tough years because I had a lot of work to do with school and everything that was going on to make ends meet, all of that, but happiest years of my freaking life. And then the two years that followed that, when I finished my graduate school work, um, still pretty poor years. I was, I mean, I was just barely covering my expenses and probably using a little bit of credit card at the time too for some extras, like maybe, you know, any extra food I needed or whatever. So, and I wasn't doing anything crazy, no crazy vacations, no crazy nothing. But my gosh, the students I was working with, the work I was doing, I was fulfilled. I was happy. And then when I moved, back to Jersey. Uh, I moved in with my parents and I was able to continue doing that work. I got that job with the school and I was having a blast. Oh my gosh. Like, so like everything was amazing. And then I started thinking about, well, what do I want? What else would make me happy going forward? And as the years went on, I had other interests. 
the big one that I'll share here, because I think this is an important one because a lot of people think about this, was travel. The one thing I wasn't doing all this time was traveling. And so, because I didn't have a corporate like travel expense budget or whatever, there was no reason, like if somebody wasn't paying for my flight, I was like, oh no, like, I guess I'm not going anywhere. I don't have all this extra money to travel. So, and that was tough because I, I did want to travel. And so I remember when I said, I want to add this dimension to my life. Well, I guess one way, the typical way is how do I make more money so that I could travel? And instead, I found another way around it. Going back to this, the pathways theory you were talking about, yeah. um, I found another way. So I became involved with an organization called Startup Weekend. Startup Weekend is a three-day event that teaches people how to uh, take a business idea from concept to creation, Friday night all the way to Sunday night. And I got involved with the event. I participated, had a blast, learned a lot. I helped somebody organize one of these events as a volunteer. And then I was introduced to the opportunity to become a facilitator, a certified facilitator for this global organization. And what that meant was that anytime these events were happening anywhere in the world, those organizers had to get a certified facilitator to come in. Now, the job didn't pay anything. I had to do that for free, but the travel was covered. And so this job took me to all these places around the world. I got to facilitate these incredible events and travel went up a whole nother level. I was no longer a tourist. I'm now embedded in the local community. I'm part of an event for three days. I'm making friends, getting to know people. All of a sudden, this incredible dimension in my life that would have been originally capped at vacation time, <laughs> staying at a resort, staying at a hotel and going to sightsee became, hey, I'm in Barcelona, you know, staying at an Airbnb with two guys that I don't know, but they live there and I'm becoming <laughs> friends with them, serving an event for three days where I'm getting to know everybody and then staying extra days at the end to like hang out with everyone because they're like, oh, stay at my place or stay at my place if your hotel's done. And the organizers paid for my time there. Sometimes they would even say, stay a couple extra nights on us because we love what you've done for us and we're not even paying you. It's the least we can do to show our appreciation. And so they would pay for me to stay extra nights and all of those kinds of things. My travel life just went nuts and I was having a blast. I used to do, I think in those years, like 12 to 15 events a year, 12 to 15 weekends a year, traveling around the world, facilitating these events. So yeah, even when I wanted other things, I found other ways to get them. So all of a sudden, I was able to just go through those years that it took to wait for other things that became great moments, like writing a book or getting a great job at IBM as an executive coach or whatever it is that were some of these other types of highlights. I had plenty of highlights to keep me fulfilled along the way. So it seems like you're, I mean, you were very tapped into sort of your, your yardstick for success as in equating it to like how happy and fulfilled do you feel like that's a very old soul uh i feel like mature um thing for a you know 20 20 ish year old um smart bright driven person to to feel i'm assuming that most of the people that you work with clients and and people in your community and things like that come to you and have not maximized have not maximized for happiness uh you know at, at this point and they're and they're saying okay i need to reinvent myself or some or circumstances are happening i need to pull off a reinvention and and maybe put happiness more at the forefront how do you co like what are the steps or the things that you are talking to them about in order to get them tapped more into i say honoring how you feel and how you're and how L uh, allowing yourself to let happiness lead um, and take that leap of faith that you will back into whatever other, you know, metrics, money that you need to. Like, how, how, do, how does that work in your world yeah. where people aren't just intuitively tapped into putting happiness first? Yeah. So I, I work with people to test things out, yeah. to test experiences because. I know that when you give something a test, a taste, you get a taste of something, such as I did when I worked at the learning center teaching math, that was just a taste. We're talking eight to 10 hours a week. You know, that's a couple hours a night. That was it. Nothing crazy. That taste was enough to show me, whoa, hold on. There's something else to me that I didn't know about. There's another dimension that I didn't know about. So for me, it's all about getting a taste. And so my mission with clients is to figure out how can I get them? And what I'm calling it now is, how do I get them from zero to step one? Because I know that if I can get them from zero to step one, step one is that taste. 
And when you get that taste of it, if it's the right taste, if it's the right thing, oh, forget about it. I need to just get out of your way because you're going to do it one way or another at this point. Um, and, and if I can help you along the way, even better, that's cool. But if I can get you to step one, I know that now you're going to be more in tune. You're going to discover something about yourself. And in the process, you become more in tune with what matters to you, what drives you, what fulfills you. And when you, when you feel that and experience it, I no longer have to explain it to you. I no longer have to convince you. You just lived it. So you tell me, how do you feel now? And it's kind of hard to, you know, to go back from there. Once you know, it's hard to unknow that. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think basically what you're suggesting is it's, it's a, I call it like a chunking down of the decision. We, we come, you know, somebody, I can imagine somebody coming to you and be like, I need to make this one decision. It has to be correct. And it's a huge decision. I, I'm thinking about changing, you know, everything that I do for a living. That's a one big wrap, you know, decision wrapped with a bow on it. And you're like, no, 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 no. We're going to break this down. We're going to take several small steps. We're going to run experiments and you're going to get more signal and more information on how that feels. And once you get hooked, <laughs> you're going to know because you're going to compare these, you're going to, you're going to be able to compare these feelings across these situations and you are going to intuitively know. So I, I love that approach. It makes all the sense in the world. You think about, I, I think about how investors run experiments with money before they really bet, you know, commit, commit big, how, um, uh, how uh, entrepreneurs and companies, you know, get product market fit by running a whole bunch of experiments. It makes all the sense in the world. And then I, and, and it's, and it's a, a similar way of what I teach as well. And then you get, okay, great. I'm hooked. This is it. I'm all in. And the, oh shit. But logically, how am I going to make that work? I, I always feel people step back. When they, yeah. well, can I make that money? Is this all BS? You know, me just feeling good about this, but I got a family to feed, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. There's that sort of like messy middle. Um, how do you, how do you talk people through that? So of course that is, th there's no one size fits all right. solution there. A lot of it is, it's asking a lot of questions. It's really trying to help them understand what, are the drivers of their decision or any future decision? What are going to be the most important factors? You know, it's it's helping them understand that there's no one size fits all thing. So be careful what you read out there or anything like that. Yeah. I'm not here to hand you questions because they are not my questions to hand you. These are your questions to discover, but I will help you discover the questions that matter to you and what really is going to impact this decision. Um, and and that comes to really trying to understand like what's holding them back, what scares them really trying to figure out those things. So then we could talk about them and let's just talk about them. Let's plan some of these things out. By the way, it took me from the point when I finished that first tutoring experiment, that one-on-one -on -one tutoring, when I put up that ad on Craigslist in 2007, whatever that was, March, February or March, when that semester ended in May and I was done with Patricio, my first client, one year until I turned in my letter of resignation. So that's a right. year of testing more trying to really push, like, do I really like this or not? Falling in love at the learning center, realizing, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like, I really do like this. Then once I decided at home or when I, when I was heading back home from the holidays or heading back to St. Louis from the holidays, and I realized I don't want to go back to my day, my day job, then, okay, how do I plan for this? I thought about the finances. I always tell people, right. look, the finances are important. I will never tell somebody, just take a leap. It'll be okay. Like, don't right. you know, trust whatever. No, no, figure out some finances, please figure out a runway. I calculated all those things. I restructured my student loan debt uh, so that I could, you know, take lower payments. And yes, I knew that came at the expense of higher interest. So of course, financially savvy people said, no, that's not a good idea. You're right. It's not a good idea if I want to pay this off sooner rather than later at the lowest cost possible. But that's not what I want above all else. What I want above all else is to discover and figure out if there is a better path for me where I can unleash a better version of myself. And that has a price, that has a value to it. And that right now is more valuable than this. So I am willing to take this additional, whatever, you know, pain later or expense later in exchange for figuring this out. So I restructured my debt, was able to get my payments down really low. Um, I 
uh, I cashed in my 401k. I, I calculated, I did the calculations um, based on what ev- the portfolio was worth at that point in time. I looked at all my living expenses. And when I mapped it out, created a nice little spreadsheet. And then I saw, okay, if I execute this plan and I make not a dime, meaning I don't do anything extra, meaning I don't def- I don't go back to parking cars, I don't tutor, I don't do anything, which I knew wasn't going to be true, then I could live for, I forget how many months, I could survive off of this for like six to 10 months. I think it was 10 months um, living, you know, of course, the minimal of the minimum of everything. But I knew I was going to do other things. I knew that if I have to go back to parking cars, I will park cars. If I got to go fold shirts at the mall, which I did, I'll fold shirts at the mall. If tutoring, I'll tutor. I'll do whatever it takes to extend this runway and continue to go. So I made those calculations. So I always tell people, like, make the calculations, figure out your numbers. These are important steps, no matter what. And everyone's numbers are going to be different. If you have a family, that's going to be a different calculation. If you if you're single, that's a calculation too. If you're single with um, at the time, I think I had about a hundred thousand in student loan debt when I was making that decision. That's a, that's like having a family, you know, when you think about those student loan payments. So there, you know, everyone has a different set of circumstances. So there's no one size fits all to this. There's no one rule that makes this right or wrong. Is this the right decision or the wrong decision? No, there will be costs to any decision. What you got to decide is what does everything cost you? What does your happiness cost? What, what's the value of your happiness? And those are the top, those are, that's where the real, I think, that's where the real work has to be done. And we don't often consider that. We think about the things that have a very hard cost. Yes, right. my, my loans have a hard cost. That's a very calculatable number. Um, but happiness, how do I calculate my happiness? I don't know. You got to think about that. You have to assign a value to some of these things and decide that, you know what? I know I'm going to pay more in interest <laughs> down the road, but I have to know. I got to do this for myself. This is something that is too important for me right now. And only you can make that decision and it comes down to your variables. And that's why I always tell people, look, my job here is to help you figure out what your decision-making variables are. I will not give them to you. Um, I can share with you what mine were, but those may not even bother you. For all I know, by the way, some people have all the money in the world to like crazy runway, still won't pull the trigger. So it's not a money issue. It's not always a money issue. Sometimes it's like a thousand other things. Maybe like you mentioned, referred to a few status. What will my friends think? What will my parents think? What will my whoever think? You know, how will I ever find a partner if I'm a deadbeat with no job? You know, <laughs> all these things that we think about, like that, are going to uh, happen. It's going to be different for everyone. You're listening to the Break Podcast, powered by Career Cloud. This episode is sponsored by ZipRecruiter. If you need a change and are looking for a new job, or if you're looking to hire for your small business, please check out ZipRecruiter today. Their smart technology matches the right candidates to the right jobs and sends new opportunities right to your inbox. They make finding a job or hiring the right person easier than ever. ZipRecruiter, the smarter way to hire. Try ZipRecruiter for free today by going to ZipRecruiter.com and tell them I sent you. A lot of what you pointed out, like what, what makes this so difficult and complex is that all of the, to do on your own, is to have all of the advice that we see when we go Google these topics, like mm-hmm. cashing in your 401k, right? All that advice is optimized for a particular outcome that isn't your situation. And so one of the tricks about of being very a very flexible resilient thinker is you have to be able to take even expert advice at face value plug it into your system of what is going on in your life and essentially put a hierarchy to your wants and needs and costs um i I talk to people about this all the time like i tell one of the things that i say online all the time is if you're like one to three years um, into your first job, I don't think you should put any money into a 401k at all, even if you have a, cus- a, a, a company match, right? Because in what you should do is take all of that money and put it in self-investment because your, your return on self-investment is multiples of even of the 6% you're going to get or of of even the 100% match that you're going to get through putting this. So it's very counterintuitive. 
But when you plug it into what you're like, all investing is relative, it is relative. So like when you plug it into what other, what your other options are, it becomes pretty clear. Um, and so I, I think that is really hard for people to do on their own because they read something and they're like, oh, I should never do that. Like my parents always told me to save 10% of my income and never do that. Why would I ever want to pay, not pay my debt off, you know, right away? Like, um, whatever Dave Ramsey tells me that <laughs> that's, that's the number one thing I should do. Right. Like, and he's an expert. We have to make, we have to critically think about our own situations. And all of this stuff has an element of risk to it. We can't know the future with certainty. So we can only do the best that we can. And to have some guidance on not what to do, but how to think about the situation yes. is from a different perspective and a different outside angle is so immensely helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I just see it time and time again. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's such a difficult problem and you need guidance from a good friend who's got a good head on their shoulders, uh, mm -hmm. a parent or whatever. But yeah. most of the time coming from someone outside is even better who has no like real, you know, emotional tie to you. Uh, yeah. it, it's just so powerful. I feel like. Yeah. I, I mean, I love what you said about the, the, the advice that you're going to find on retirement, uh, you know, investments and all of that. Yeah. The person who wrote that article, their mission is to get you the most predictable the highest predictable return possible what you're offering is an even higher return that is less predictable yes because you can't predict what that self investment return is going to be right and so a financial advisor would never give that advice no. and so I think, you know, and the same goes for like a doctor. The doctor's mission is to keep exactly. you alive as long as possible. But maybe you're not worried about staying alive as long as possible. Maybe you're worried about be, living the most fulfilling life that you can while you're alive. And maybe that's a different thing. And that requires taking a risk that a doctor might say, no, I would not advise you to do that. You know, I learned something about asking questions uh, when, when I hired a lawyer like several years ago, when we were trying to figure out what was the, so my wife is from, uh, from Romania and she was in Ireland working for Google and she, and you know, we, we got married and we were trying to figure out like, what's the best way to do that process for her to come to the U to U S to move. So when I prepared my notes. So we met with a, an immigration lawyer and I guess I could have asked, we want her to come here, um, as fast as possible. What do we got to do? Well, the lawyer's like, oh, perfect. Well, that's what I do. I give you the best possible, the fastest possible, the whatever, you know, possible. I will give you that answer. And they know that answer. But then we talked, my wife and I talked about what do we really want out of this? And we came up with our requirements. So then my question was different to the lawyer when we prepared. And when I asked this question, I sent that question to her lawyer. I remember the morning or the day before the, our meeting. And I said, here's the key question. We want to have her come to the United States and we need these two conditions to be met. Given those two conditions, what is the best solution? And now I've given this expert, this legal expert who has all the knowledge to help me, the direction she needs, the parameters she needs within which to play and give me the best answer. Because I didn't want to have to figure that one out because I'm like, I still don't know. I don't know enough about immigration law to know given those conditions. And then she gave me this feedback at the end of our meeting. And she said, by the way, that was a great question because it made it so easy to sit down with you and just tell you what your options. There were only two. And the two, and it was, and even those two weren't really two. There was really only one given the parameters you gave. And so she didn't give me what would normally probably in an article be the best advice, you know, that a, a, a lawyer writing for a thousand people that might be reading that article or tens of thousands would write. No, she gave me the best answer for me. And so I think the lesson from there that listeners can take away is know your parameters. Like, what are you trying to maximize for? What's the outcome that you're trying to drive? If you're going to go to an expert, 
make sure that you make those outcomes and those parameters that you're trying to maximize for very clear because then you give them the best possible chance of giving you really good advice that could help you. So if I told that financial advisor that, look, I'm not here to maximize gar- like you know uh, predictable returns or anything like this. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. I want to quit my job by this day. I want to be able to do this, da, 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 all these things. Then now I've taken away all of the normal rules. Now they have to really think, okay, how would I guide the person knowing everything I know with those parameters? Right. And then I hope from there, they can give me some very custom tailored advice. So I think there's still a chance we can give to be like, people can still help us out, but blog articles are not going to cut it because they're not writing it for your parameters. They're writing it for the general, like usually the best, the fastest, the most convenient. That's it. Like that's what articles are for. They cover that part. But when you sit down with an expert, they could also tell you the same thing. So you got to come in with a good question. And if you don't, you know, and that's one of the things I think I've learned along the journey, ask really good questions. Um, make sure, make your questions great because if you do, then you'll get the answers that you really need that could really unlock things for you, such as what was the best way for my wife to get here? By the way, it was not the fastest, but it was the most effective and it met all our parameters. Yeah. And to kind of like, um, I guess related to the, that pathways theory again, like I think most, w- what happens is when you go Google this problem, you come back with results that are like, okay, the, what you're thinking about doing is suboptimal. You shouldn't do it. Um, that's a, a blocker. And most people are like, oh, okay, I can't do this. But the flexible, resilient, change-oriented thinker you know, goes against the grain and says, well, why not? Um, yeah, maybe this isn't optimal for everyone, but it, given my situation, given my circumstances, given what, do I, wa- what I want to accomplish, I can do this. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's, I mean, that's a huge piece of what I try to do in this podcast is get people to not dogmatically follow rules, basically. Yeah. Break certain rules, break certain norms in order to move towards the path that you, that you want. Like, that's why this is called the break. We need to, we need to, we need to break our own self-concepts. We need to break rules and situations and norms so that we can do what is pulling, what's pulling at us to be. Yeah. Um, all right. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, we covered some of, we get, we covered some of the reinvention in your story, but the story is not over there, right? Like it's not, you're not a one and done reinventor. You have come to make the concept of reinvention your life's work today. You've written a yeah. book, you have a program, you coach people, um, you are a, a professor uh, as well and talk a lot about this within your classwork. What was it about this topic that pulled you so hard to commit the re- you know the, your life's work in this area? Was there a moment or or a yeah. specific sequence of events that's that you said I got to do this. This is the next dedication. Yeah. So the moment for me was in uh June 20 June May June 2020. I, at the time, was working at IBM and it was, you know, at the peak of the pandemic. So the world was still on lockdown, all of those kinds of things. And I got laid off um, at, along with like about 10,000 other people got laid off in, a, in the first round, first of many rounds of layoffs, unfortunately. But that was a tough round because the world is still locked down. And so I was just, of course, you know, went through a lot of emotions and feelings won't go through that now because that's just a longer story. But that day I called a mentor of mine from the company at the company at IBM, who someone who had been at IBM for like 25 years. And she was somebody that I was working closely with on a lot of executive coaching initiatives at the company. And I told her what happened. And she said that ultimately she wasn't worried about me. She goes, you've Re- you've, she said, you've reinvented yourself. You've always figured this out. You've been out there. You know, you've done so many things. I'm not worried about you because I know you will find and create the next opportunity for yourself. She goes, I'm worried about the other 10,000 people that got laid off with you, yeah. many of which are older than you, significantly older than you. They're old enough to be your parents in some cases. 
And when they got into IBM, there was no LinkedIn, there were no electronic resumes. They were turned in by hand, you know, or sent by mail. It was a very different time. They were getting jobs in the 90s, maybe the early 2000s. And these are folks that have been at the company 20, 30, 40 years. In fact, one of the people I met through the, uh, in, as part of the layoff, 42 years and he got laid off. So he was like right at the end of like about to retire and they let him go. Uh, they, ret- they laid him off. And she goes, I want you to help them prepare for this next chapter of their lives. This is a scary one for them. And I feel, and she goes, you have all the skills necessary to do this. So I think it's your responsibility to find a way to do this. And that was the gift. She gave me the gift of purpose at a moment when I had, thir- by the way, we all had 30 days. So it wasn't one of those layoffs where you're like, everything's turned off that day. It's like, hey, you have 30 days and then you're out. So she gave me purpose for the next 30 days. She says, I want you to figure this out. I didn't know how. She didn't tell me how. <laughs> so I'm like, oh boy, I got to figure out how do I do this? How do I find these people? First of all, there's no list, but I found them. I figured out a way, uh, internal communications. We had Slack, all these tools. So I just found the way to get the word out. And eventually I recruited 750 people into what I called the reinvention mastermind. It met three times a week. And for these sessions, I did three things. I opened with a few stories. So I would take stories from my life and my reinventions, but I also take stories from my dad's life, some of his tough reinventions, because some of most of these folks are older than me. So I needed a story stories from someone closer to their age so that they can see the relation and the connection. Then I would distill it into a lesson. And then I would do breakout room activities on Zoom. So I did this for a month. And in the process, I fell in love with this. I go, this is amazing. Like, this is fulfilling. And I started realizing I know a lot more about this than I thought, because this forced me to go back through my old stories, through my experiences, and try to figure out what were the lessons? What did I do? How did I make that switch? How did I make that other switch? And as I started to collect all of this, I realized, I have something here. And so it was during that experience that it hit me. It was almost at the end of my, like the last few days at IBM before they were going to shut off all our uh, access and everything. And we were officially done that it hit me. I want this to be the next chapter of my life. I don't know how long this chapter will be. I don't even know what it's going to look like. Is it a company? Is it a course? Is it a mastermind? Am I a coach? Am I a teacher? Am I a speaker? Am I an author? No clue. No clue what it was going to be. But that's how it started with math. I had no idea. All I knew was that I love doing this thing. So it's time to go find a way. So I committed to this path. I, just like that time, figured out my runway. I had severance. I had savings. I cashed out my 401k again, except this time I rolled it over into an IRA before I cashed it all out. <laughs> it turns out I, so I thought maybe I won't need to do that step. So I'll buy myself some time by moving it into an IRA, take a little bit more control of what I do with it, kind of put some more of it in cash for now, just in case as a, as a safety. Uh, luckily, I didn't have to draw on that. I was able to draw on other things. And I got to work on figuring it out. Bumpy ride again, ups and downs, lots of scary moments, moments where I thought, what the hell am I doing? Um, I don't think I know what the hell I'm doing. And then moments where I'm like, I think I got it all figured out, only to realize I don't have it all figured out. I have nothing figured out. Back to the drawing board, <laughs> figured out again. And then I ended up you know, along the way writing a book. That was perhaps one of the big moments where all of a sudden I realized, okay, now I'm starting to get a handle on what this is. And little by little, I started figuring out my ideal clients, my, you know, like who the persona is that I want to support and serve the most. And then I started to build more products. The podcast came, the newsletter, a YouTube channel will be coming later this year. So a lot of things like started falling into place, but this all started with that layoff and the opportunity to serve these people during that time. And it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. I, in fact, I opened my book, The Journey to Reinvention. I open it with that story. That's the intro. I talk about that story, that layoff, and how I was able to turn that layoff into the next chapter of my life. That is amazing. I didn't know that um, about you, but, you know, from, from our previous conversation. What a seminal moment. I, I love moments. Um, I'm a huge, like, I don't know why I'm just a huge fan, fan of moments. And I, I call these moments break moments where you basically like yeah. you have a self-concept, you have a view of the world and something happens that shatters that. And you were in this moment of, oh my God, what am I going to do? I just got laid off. I'm Roger, the laid off guy. 
And she says, it was a woman, right? That you met yeah. with, is that correct? Yeah, yeah okay. Jennifer. And she, yeah, and she says, eh, I'm not worried about you. In fact, you have everything. Quit whining. Go serve these people. And in an instant, in that moment, destroyed <laughs> you know obviously you still you still had some uncertainty and all of this kind of yeah. stuff but it gave you that clarity to be like all right yeah i do have this let's go do that let's channel all of this into the into a purpose you know i mean yeah. I, I just like i get goosebumps feeling that it's amazing and, and with for me i'm on the path i'm on because of my ki three kids right here i'm thinking about what is the number one skill thing attribute whatever that i can teach them to be so they can handle they can thrive right in any situation whatever happens to them and to me it's essentially what encompasses re, you know reinvention it's, it's it's how to be resilient adaptable and flexible how do you teach this as a skill set because change is happening so so much right layoffs are happening industries are coming and going, technologies are coming and going, right? Like how, what, what are the key things where I can teach somebody, I can drop them off in the woods, right? I can drop my kids off in the woods and I know they're going to be okay. It's resilience, flexibility, adaptability. And those are the core hallmarks of reinvention. And I know in your coaching and in what you do and your books and, and in your speeches, those elements are in there. Um, and so that's why like, I just am so, I'm so excited to know you and to know that there's other people out there like hammering on these, on these issues and, and, and trying to get the word out and trying to help people who are blindsided by events, right? Yeah. How do we help them not feel so alone or flailing in the wind? Like, how do we I, help I say people? devastated. I use devastated. the word devastated. Yeah. How do that's we help them not feel devastated? Because there will be devastating moments on the journey. You know what I, the way I describe this and kind of also an answer to that original question as well. And the other answer to it is, you know, when you were asking, you know, how has reinvention just become my thing where I can yeah. just do it whenever the time comes. And, and a big part of it is that I say that the way I describe it is that over time, our values, our passions, and our purpose um, evolve. But what usually doesn't evolve as quickly are the external um, environment, our jobs, maybe our family situation, our living situation, our financials, our wealth, whatever you name it, our health, our wellness, don't evolve with us as we're growing and changing. And that creates that gap. So as, as one line is going up and the other's kind of staying the same, that gap creates more and more tension. The wider that gap gets, yeah. the more tension that you feel. And that's that feeling where like something's not right in my life. I'm just yes. going through the motions, but I can't describe what it is. More yes. That. It's that you're growing, you're evolving and your mission and, and the opportunity, what I invite you to do is to figure out how to get those external parts of your life more in alignment with who you're becoming. And, and that has to be done because every five years or so, we're really starting to make some big changes. The yes. evolution really shows up, I think, in about every five years. In fact, I did a quick analysis, or not a quick analysis, a pretty thorough analysis of my own life for an article that I'm still working on. And I noticed, oh my gosh, it's increments of five years that my definition of success changed. Like almost perfectly five yeah. years. I'm like, wow, it's <laughs> kind of crazy. So we're changing, we're growing and evolving pretty significantly about every five years. And if the other areas of your life are not evolving and or keeping up, and don't worry, they don't have to be perfectly in sync. They just have to trail and be, but it has to be trying to keep up with your evolving self. And when you do that, the thing about the journey to reinvention is that when you're in more alignment and that gap is not so wide, the ups and downs of the journey are not so, the downs are not so devastating. Right. That's the result. That's the outcome. And that's what I've learned along the journey, because you know what? I've, I've uh, been fired. I've been uh, laid off a couple times. I've been divorced. Um, I've been in a crap ton of debt and had a lot of debt collectors calling me. A lot of these things have happened, really tough moments. And, what I, and when I share with people these stories, I say, but you know what? At the end of the day, none of these moments were devastating. They could have been, but because I was, a, as I was living a life that, uh, that was aligned close pretty closely aligned with my values my passions and my purpose at any given time 
I never felt the devastating effects of those moments. Don't get me wrong. I was sad. I'm really sad. I, I mean, I was very sad. I, the divorce part, all that, that, um, that was tough. But it could have really wrecked me. It could have thrown things completely out of whack. I was in the final semester of two master's programs when that happened. I could have given up on both of those right at the finish line, right at the finish line. I could have given up and I wanted to. I felt really bad, but I found a way. And I truly believe I found a way because I was doing things that really matter to me. Areas of my life were in alignment. So even though one fell completely out of whack, I had plenty of other areas. I was still working with students on the side and tutoring them. That brought me so much love. You better believe those hours that I spent tutoring every day were the most joyful hours of my life. And they were the ones that were my medicine during a really tough Mm -hmm. moment when I was really sad, really depressed. So I had that. I had other areas of my life. I played soccer on an amazing team with an amazing group of guys that were there for me. And, And that time that I spent in the weekends with them, oh my gosh, therapeutic, like so magical, so needed. I was able to recover from everything and finish both master's programs on time. Why? Because this moment that could have been devastating was prevented from being devastating because I was living a life aligned with my values, passions, and purpose. So what makes reinvention, I guess, a little easier for me now is that when I noticed that I'm changing and things are evolving, I'm like, hey, what can I do to get things in alignment in all areas of my life, my health and my wellness, my fitness, my family, my relationship with my wife, my, you know, all those things, my work, what I'm doing. That's why the podcast came to life. Because I started evolving and shifting and realizing that this is something that I'm that feels right, even though it didn't feel right three years ago, it feels really right now. So I'm going to lean into this a little bit more. Now YouTube is starting to become. So I'm evolving with it. I'm letting, I'm allowing the business to also keep up with me as I'm growing. And so that for me is the key. And when you see it that way, I think reinvention is like, hey, I got to do this. Obviously, I have to keep up with who I'm developing into and who I'm growing to become. Awesome. I am, it's really safe for me to say that this is probably installment one of our conversations of, of many. I got to get going to, uh, take my kids to, um, to basketball, but I know we will be talking again. I'm going to finish this up in kind of rapid fire, uh, question, uh, question and answer, um, fashion to just get, to just try to kind of put a bow on this, on this one. But I feel like next time we talk, it's going to center around, balance and how we create that within our lives holistically. Um, that just mm-hmm. feels like where we're leaving off and yeah. in a natural progression. So, um, all right, my rapid fire questions for you to close this out. Is there a recent author, thought leader, or influencer that you've come across that has really caught your attention and you think we all need to be paying attention to? Yeah, for me, it's, and this one's not super recent, but recently became more important to me, Ali Abdal. Okay. A the YouTuber, he's, right? on, he's got, yeah, he's a YouTuber, yeah. has a YouTube channel and actually recently published this book called Feel Good Productivity. Um, it just came out. So I just got my copy of it and I'm get, I'm into it really great. But I think that, uh, his message, a lot of videos go back to like 2020 videos, 2021 videos. Okay, cool. Um, what book are you reading now or have read recently that has influenced you a lot? Not including Ali's book. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I've, I'm, I'm like getting into this one, Rediscovering Catholicism. I got Matthew that one. Kelly. Yeah. So this one is <laughs> already making an impact and I'm really only at the beginning of it, but this is the one I'm currently reading that is just like, wow. And it's a big part of one of my goals this year. So this book is really important to me, right? It's now. an interesting one. Uh, you know, we can talk about, <laughs> we can okay. talk about our, our, our journeys with that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I did just get his new his new book the rocking chair prophet my parents gave to me um i believe it's more of a nonfiction book i haven't read it yet but um that's from him as well uh all right do you have one piece of advice for someone just starting out or trying to get a foothold in this world talk to people interview people i mean just it's the fastest way to get out of your own head and 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 open you up to new possibilities new ideas new voices and new perspectives so yeah get out there and talk to people that you don't know What's got you excited about the next 12 months? Uh, what I talked about a little bit earlier, the podcast and the YouTube channel. So the YouTube awesome. channel is going to be new in this year. So that's like, I'm really excited about it. I'm going through uh, Ali Abdal's part-time YouTuber Academy. That's why he kind of cool. came back into my life, even though for a little bit, it was uh, he was dormant. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, this part-time YouTuber Academy is amazing. 
Uh, so that, and then growing the podcast, you know, uh, we're in season two and I'm loving every minute of it. In fact, I have a great guest named Mike Gardone who's come in on the show in That's a couple right. weeks. <clears throat> Coming so, on. There yep. we go. That's going to be fun. Awesome. I got a couple, uh, just a couple more that I didn't give you. So I'm going to catch yeah, you off yeah. guard a little bit. Nah, let's do it. What's the biggest thing you've had to unlearn on your journey? Oh, I guess my way of looking at investing in myself and investing in my business. You know, when you're in corporate for so long and between my two corporate jobs, they were influential enough even. And I didn't, I haven't been in corporate all my life, but they, they, they really instilled these ideas that like someone else pays for your yeah. professional development. Someone else pays for talent. Someone else pays for the different departments and skills. And now I'm having to do this. And the biggest breakthrough for me was when I spent I think it was about $8,000 to go to biz- Tony Robbins Business Mastery. And it was the biggest investment I made in myself. Just like, boom, straight up paid that. And so glad I did it. And it was a breakthrough moment for me because I realized, wow, I need to be doing more of this in other areas too. So yeah, that was a big thing I had to unlearn. I'm still unlearning it. It still creeps up from time to time where I hesitate to make an expense or spend on something that mm-hmm. is that could be a valuable investment to the company or to my business or to myself. And then I, I'm a little worried about it and I have to remind myself, no, this is what it takes. And I believe in this and, and I know the problem and I know this is a good fit. So I got to take that uh, leap of faith. Self-investment is such a big big part of reinvention. I have writings online. You can find them if you Google on the difference between it expensing th- something and investing in yourself and and how it's yeah. key and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so you're speaking my language there. Did you learn anything about yourself in our time together today? Yeah. I mean, you, you asked me a couple of questions about like how I arrived at that decision to quit. Like what was the, like, what were the kind of workings? Like how did the gears turn and everything work? to arrive at such a decision that I knew that this was the right thing to do. I hadn't really reflected on that in that level of depth, I think. And so for me, it was really interesting. So I'm looking forward to this recording because I think I want to expand on that into an article and turn that into an article. So for me, that was a big one. Uh, So I appreciate that you asked that. Awesome. And then last, just where can people find you online? We've got a book, we've got a community, we've got you, you're all flying all over the world doing speaking and events, and I'm learning from you about that whole process as well. But tell folks where they can find more about you, follow you, and get in touch with you. Yeah. So my website is rogerosorio.com, R O G E R O S O R I O.com. And that's really where everything is. That's the hub for everything. So you can follow me on Instagram from there, LinkedIn from there. And then, of course, you can learn more about the podcast and link to the podcast, my coaching, speaking, all of that is lives there. So that's kind of the spot. And you can sign up for the newsletter right from that page. Perfect. Uh, I highly suggest you guys go check out his newsletter. If you follow me on LinkedIn, you will be seeing Roger and I colliding in in uh, in that medium a lot yeah. uh, in the in the near future. Here, I highly recommend you grab his book. It's amazing. He's got so much wisdom beyond the hour and a half we've just gone today um, imparted in that book. And I highly suggest you go get it. Again, you will hear Roger more from Roger on my podcast and um, going forward in, in some of the things that we are going to... We're, we're just always going to be in touch and stay, stay in contact. So more to come there. But Roger, thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom with with our audience. I think I got a ton out of it and I know they did too. And I can't wait to have the tables flipped in a couple of weeks and talk to you again, my friend. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the time. I appreciate you uh, and the fact that we are now connected. I'm so glad that Darren introduced us and yeah. you know realized that these two humans need to talk, even though he didn't really know you super well. Right. He knew these two guys need to get to know each other better. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to many more conversations and same thing on my podcast. I feel like there's so many topics we can explore for those hour, hour and a half conversations that will add a lot of value to people in my community as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here and we will chat soon. Absolutely. <laughs>